Oh, how things have changed. Two years ago, this crazy new finger training method took the climbing community by storm, with Emil and Felix Abramson reporting incredible improvements in finger strength by hangboarding two times per day for 30 days. It seemed like a revelation, especially considering there's even a research paper to help explain how it all worked. But now, two years later, both the Abramson brothers and we at Hooper's Beta have learned a lot, and it's safe to say, our opinions on this routine are not quite the same as they originally were. So in this video, we're going in depth to explain what's really going on here and what's probably not going on, which I think is even more useful. Most importantly, we'll cover what this means for you with insight into whether or not you should be doing this routine and how it compares to normal high intensity protocols. You'll know more about how hangboarding works than pretty much anyone who doesn't watch this video. So let's get into it. By the way, this video is sponsored by Squarespace, the only website building platform we use. First, a brief recap of what got us here in the first place. A 2017 research paper titled Minimizing Injury and Maximizing Return to Play, Lessons from Engineered Ligaments, details the results of an experiment by Paxton and colleagues involving tendon-like tissue or sinew. Among other things, they find that even when low-level loads are applied, the sinew responds with increased tenocyte activity and ultimately increased collagen concentration. These results lead one of the researchers, Keith Barr, to suggest that humans may be able to improve tendon physiology with a similar protocol, up to 10 minutes of low-intensity exercise with at least 6 hours in between. Hoping they can leverage this to their benefit in climbing, Emil and Felix loosely follow these guidelines to create their fingerboard protocol. And what do you know? After Emil's 30-day challenge, his results are astounding. Then, in the two-year follow-up video, Emil notes he was able to achieve a series of new strength and climbing benchmarks, most notably 159 on campus board and sending his first V15. Now, considering this hangboard routine seems to fly in the face of every high-intensity protocol out there, we're left with a glaring question. How could lightweight hangs have such huge benefits? And before you say, uh, it's all explained by the research paper in collagen synthesis, you might want to hold that thought. It would be a mistake to assume that the sinew study fully explains Emil and Felix's gains for a couple of reasons. First, Barr's recommendations about tissue loading, which Emil's protocol is based on, stem from an in vitro study. Young, lab-grown sinew in a nutrient gel attached to cement anchors is a far, far cry from something like a real tendon in an adult man's hand hanging onto a board. While we certainly shouldn't discount in vitro studies as useless, we should be aware that in vitro results are frequently found incompatible with real-world findings. So we shouldn't assume the sinew study's findings also happen to Emil. Second, Barr's recommendations are, understandably, quite open-ended. That leaves room for tons of other variables that could affect Emil's results. The only specific part of the sinew study Emil could have followed was the time under load, 10 minutes. But Emil actually chose a much shorter duration because he wisely wanted to play it conservative. To me, and hopefully to you, this means we shouldn't be so quick to use the sinew study to draw conclusions about Emil's results. To truly explain that, we need to look at other possibilities, and this is where we learn a lot about how hangboarding works and doesn't work. Let's determine which mechanisms could be causing Emil's gains. 1. Muscle hypertrophy In simple terms, muscle hypertrophy is when a muscle increases in size. This is relevant for climbers because the cross-sectional area of a muscle is the biggest determining factor of its strength. This is a huge, often overlooked aspect of how something like hangboarding can help climbers progress. Under the right conditions, that isometric contraction can cause our muscles to adapt by increasing in size, aka hypertrophy. But there's one big caveat. The muscle won't grow if you don't give it enough stimulus over the course of the workout. You don't have to go all the way to failure, but you need to get in the vicinity if you're doing low intensity reps. Emil's protocol is specifically designed to stay far away from fatigue, so it's extremely unlikely even two times per day was enough for his hangs to induce muscular hypertrophy, especially considering Emil is not some random, untrained research participant, but a highly experienced athlete. That means we can confidently rule out increase of muscle size as a direct result of Emil's protocol. Side note, if you did want to try to force muscle hypertrophy with Emil's protocol, you could do blood flow restriction as that can drastically increase muscle fatigue even with low loads. What about the tendons and ligaments in our hands? Maybe the low intensity hangs are enough to cause those to grow, strengthen, and ultimately increase our finger strength. Unfortunately, relevant research on something like tendon growth protocols is hard to come by in general and non-existent for climbers specifically, 
Of course, that's not to say growth does not occur in connective tissue. On the contrary, we know it does. For example, we have empirical evidence showing climbers can have significantly thicker pulleys than non-climbers. We also have evidence that the Achilles tendon can increase in cross-sectional area when participants perform high intensity, about 90% volitional max, exercises. The Achilles tendons did not grow in people performing lower intensity exercises. So, while we don't have enough data to say exactly how Emil's hangs affected his connective tissue, we can make some educated guesses. Given the current evidence, it appears connective tissue grows under similar conditions as muscles, meaning relatively high fatigue or high load is required in trained individuals. This may not be the case with damaged tissue or in untrained individuals, but Emil is a presumably healthy, well-trained athlete. Therefore, the extremely low fatigue in Emil's protocol makes it unlikely to have caused meaningful thickening of his tendons and ligaments. 3. Tendon Stiffening This is one of the main factors we discussed in the first video we made in response to Emil's original video. However, since then my opinion has changed. Originally, we cited research showing that isometric exercises can increase tendon stiffness as a plausible explanation for why Emil's hangboarding seemed to work, noting how stiffer flexor tendons could in theory lead to increased finger strength. Upon further inspection though, I think a few key details somewhat undermine this argument. Overall, most of the research only shows moderate to high intensity exercises increases tendon stiffness, around the 70 to 100% 1 rep max range, though smaller effects could still happen at milder intensities. Now, this research is not perfect, nor is it perfectly applicable to climbers. Ultimately though, Emil's protocol was probably not high enough intensity to meaningfully increase flexor tendon stiffness. I'm definitely not convinced there was zero tendon stiffening, and perhaps even a small change could produce some interesting results, but I think it's highly unlikely that the tendon stiffening led to any large improvements or increased risk of injury. But what about ligaments? What if stiffer pulleys increased Emil's crimp abilities? It's certainly possible, but research on ligament stiffening suggests it happens as a byproduct of thickening, and as we learned in the previous section, notable connective tissue thickening seems to result more from high intensity stimulus, so again, probably not applicable in Emil's case. You know what doesn't require a bunch of in-depth explanations? Building your online brand with Squarespace. You can create your own unique individual space to help launch your business or blog, which is one of the features that we love. We love creating in-depth show notes and Squarespace makes it easy to upload our links, pictures,
The fibers that make up our tendons and ligaments are not always perfectly aligned, especially where injuries have occurred. Applying force or stretch to the tissue causes increased activity from little cells called tenocytes, while also uncrimping the collagen fibers, both of which can improve the orientation and strength of the tissue. Research shows tissue remodeling can occur in damaged Achilles tendons even with something as simple as massage, so it's reasonable to think Emil's protocol could have caused some remodeling in his fingers. On the other hand, numerous animal studies indicate that high volume or hypertrophy-like training has a much higher impact on remodeling than low fatigue training. And remodeling in untrained and or injured tissue is much more pronounced than in trained and or healthy tissue. Since Emil's protocol is low intensity, low fatigue, and he is a highly trained individual, any remodeling that did occur wouldn't be hugely significant, probably enough to contribute to his results, but certainly not enough to fully explain them. That is, unless Emil and Felix's connective tissue was significantly damaged, in which case the remodeling effects would probably be greater. The reason I'm not fully convinced tissue remodeling is the main mechanism of Emil's protocol is because neither of the brothers reported having serious finger injuries, only a sort of generic tweakiness. And that's where this final mechanism takes the cake. Number six, pain science. Similar to what we learned in the recruitment section, when we have pain, our brains will naturally want to decrease force production in that area. So no surprise, our fingers can literally be weaker if they feel painful, regardless of the tissue's actual strength. This can also create a bit of a feedback loop where we become conditioned to expect pain in certain situations, which can cause even more strength attenuation, fear response, and even exaggerated feelings of pain. This then creates a set of rules in our brain that help determine what we will and will not allow ourselves to do, both consciously and subconsciously. So of course, if Emil's routine somehow eliminated pain or discomfort in his fingers, it would make a lot of sense that they would feel and literally be stronger. But why would low intensity hangs accomplish this specifically? Studies have shown that isometric exercises can alter our acute pain response through a complex mechanism. Essentially, your pain receptors are less active or excitable, your CNS is better able to dampen the pain response and the inhibitory inner neurons, and you can change your perspective of that stimulus. It would be fair to argue that this is a form of recruitment, but it's not exactly strength recruitment in the traditional sense, so I'm considering it a separate mechanism. Regardless, as a result, your body's rules have been rewritten. Within the first month, I just felt, my fingers felt healthier than they ever have before. Instead of worrying about an injury, you focus on trying hard. It's not only did I increase my max hangs by like 10 kilos, I also just felt completely fine in my fingers. Instead of feeling average, you feel sight. I also added a bunch of other training routines and you know things, and I, I, I would say I was the strongest I've probably ever been. Instead of performing that way you always do, you perform better. Uh, on top of this, I also kept doing it for the Ticino trip, which is when I did my first 8C boulder and managed to do 159 for the first time. And voila, in a relatively short amount of time, you've made significant gains in your climbing and training metrics. In fact, that's exactly what Emil and Felix did. There are, of course, several other, far more vague, less interesting explanations for all of this that could still absolutely have caused some or all of Emil's results, like his diet, sleep, personal life, mindset, etc. Often these boring variables have much larger effects than we like to admit. And speaking of boring variables, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention the placebo effect. Yes, I know, no one wants to admit that their brain made something up that consequently became their reality, but it can, does, and will continue to happen. With that out of the way, it's time for some conclusions. So, what have we learned? Muscle hypertrophy appears unlikely. The hangs are too low intensity. Connective tissue thickening in significant amounts appears unlikely for the same reason. Stiffening of the tendons may have occurred in small amounts, but generally seems to require higher intensities. Strength recruitment might have happened at some level, but probably not a significant or useful amount as the intensity was so low. Connective tissue remodeling probably contributed to Emil and Felix's results, though the amount is quite dependent on how unhealthy their tissue actually was. Pain science is almost certainly at play, with diminished discomfort leading to psychological and physiological improvements, more and better training, and ultimately improved performance. Boring and unsatisfying but equally important other mechanisms almost certainly had a large effect, though it's impossible to prove how much. This all probably caused some direct strength improvements, but more importantly, allowed both brothers to climb and train harder, 
pushing their limits with newfound confidence, they got stronger. So the fingerboarding helped open the door and subsequent climbing and training pushed them through it. But they wouldn't have found the door in the first place without their prior experience and fitness base. Smart training, hard work, and a healthy mindset is where gains come from in the long term. And there's simply no getting around that. With all that said, just because it worked for the Abramsims doesn't mean you should do it too. So let's wrap things up with some recommendations. If you're hoping to replace high intensity hangboarding with Emil's routine, you should think twice. The mechanisms that make high intensity finger training effective are not at play in these low intensity hangs. If you're hoping to accomplish certain feats of strength like 159 on the campus board or hanging on 6mm edges, Emil's protocol is not the way as those require specific strength training that low intensity hangs don't provide. When it comes to building strength long term, high and low intensity exercises are not interchangeable. If you're totally new to climbing or feel intimidated by high intensity hangboard protocols, Emil's protocol is a virtually risk-free way to build confidence with fingerboarding positions, allowing you to start with as low of an intensity as you want with no extra gear required. Even more experienced climbers can use this method to experiment with grip positions and cover useful insights about grip preferences, finger morphology, specific weaknesses, etc. If your fingers feel healthy and you're currently seeing good progress with your high intensity finger training, I see no strong need to add this low intensity protocol into the mix. You certainly can if you want, but your time could be spent on more productive things, such as improving mobility, addressing that nagging shoulder issue, etc. If you're looking for a nice, gentle warm up, I think Emil's protocol can be useful. It's definitely not a complete finger warm up, but especially for people who always tend to feel tweaky in the beginning of sessions, spending more time specifically loading your fingers safely is worthwhile. Don't get too caught up on the six hours in between sessions aspect. If you're using this as a warm up, you can proceed to climbing immediately afterward. Lastly, if your fingers feel tweaky and not so great like Emil and Felix's did, I think this protocol is worth considering. The only reason I'm not 100% behind it is because there are other methods that can help with these issues that I often prefer as a PT. For example, farmer crimps or no hangs provide a much more consistent, trackable load. Also, if you're in any kind of pain, I generally recommend figuring out what the actual cause is if possible. Are you ignoring an injury that needs rest and rehab? How's your sleep, diet, and are you managing your training load well? Overall, I do think increasing the frequency of light loads to our fingers can be quite useful and is something I prescribe to some patients as a way to promote healing. If you enjoy ultra thorough breakdowns like this, please support the channel by subscribing, buying a t-shirt, telling your friends, or whatever you want. Until next time, train, climb, send, and repeat.